1999, Rob co-created the Skills for Healing Cancer Weekend Retreats. These weekends supported group teaching, groups teach a powerful and integrated approach to cancer diagnosis and ways to heal at, all, at levels of body, mind, and spirit. To date, 1,900 people have attended 50-plus retreats in 25-plus cities across Canada and abroad. Rob is the CEO and chair of the Healing and Cancer Foundation and a registered charity that freely offers educational videos, documentaries, and webcasting seminars. He's the co-author of the book of Healing Circle, which captures the teaching and inspirational stories for the weekend retreats. Rob has received a Cancer Care Nova Scotia Award for Excellence in Patient Care, and Doctors Nova Scotia presented him with a Health Promotion Award in recognition for his contributions to physician health and health promotion in cancer patients. So Gilda's Club Greater Toronto is very happy to introduce Dr. Rob Rutledge, and we hope you enjoy his talk. I'll take my hug down. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. We just walked across uh, campus at University of Toronto. So a kilometer from here, over 30 years ago, I was going to medical school. And I think it's taken 30 years for me to come to this point to give you this talk. Because I was really, um, you know, in those days, it was very much about physical medicine. And I've had these experiences of seeing the world from a bigger perspective. I want to share that with you and to offer you very practical advice about what you can do to empower yourself, body, mind, and spirit, and really make a difference in terms of improving your chances of recovery and feeling better and so on. So I'm like a kid in a candy shop right now. Really, really happy to be here. Part of Gilda's Club. And also just to, to take a deep bow to all of you, you showed up on an absolutely fantastically beautiful <laughs> Toronto evening. You know, actually I think that sends a very powerful message to your psyche and your soul and your spirit your body about healing and wholeness and the fact that you want to get better, you want to be well. So really, hats off, for, hats off to you. So I'll tell you a bit of the story, recognizing I want to offer you the kind of complete package so that when you walk away an hour and a half from now, you're thinking, yes, I'm on the right track. There's a sense of reassurance, I'm not missing anything. And you'll walk away with some very, very practical tools that will help you, your mind and your body kind of release that kind of healing potential. So I'm really excited to give you something very, very practical uh, tonight. But I'll tell you a bit of the story so that it puts it in the context of why you know, this medical physician, this oncologist is talking about something that's much, much bigger. So my first year of medical school, it felt very, very dry. Um, you know, get the knowledge, apply the diagnosis, give the treatment. Uh, I was looking for something more. I was thinking about psychiatry. I was thinking about working with people affected by addictions. And it was one of those moments uh, where the universe conspired. The book kind of drops off the shelf and lands in your lap. One of those moments. And the book that chose me was called Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Dr. Bernie Siegel. And Bernie was a Ivy League cancer surgeon. He was also a pioneer in support groups. And something within him, something within his spirit was having him share his knowledge, how to live your life between the, the visits and so on. And um, it was my first exposure, and I'm really, really thinking about this, this issue ever since, this first exposure of what he called exceptional cancer patients. The people that do exceptionally well, whose tumors shrink away very quickly, who get through incredibly hard treatments, who far outlive the expectations of their doctors. The, the remarkable ones, the um, people who have undergone spontaneous remission, and so on. And I take a quick time out. I take exception to exceptional, because I actually think we all have that capacity to kind of tap into something that's bigger than what we see in this physical world. Um, and I can remember reading this and um, crying, and just knowing I really wanted to be an oncologist, and I really wanted to run support groups, and 30 years later, I'm fulfilling that dream of a young medical student. So really very, very excited and happy to be here. So Bernie talked about his certain attributes of his remarkable survivors and um, the ones who did exceptionally well. And the first attribute that he, he described was actually that his remarkable cancer survivors, the exceptional cancer patients, were truly willing to accept their situation, accept their diagnosis. And acceptance is not uh, the sense of uh, giving up 
uh, resignation, abdicating your responsibility, you no know, kind of totally letting go. Acceptance is more this idea of being able to see the truth for what it is, to see the reality as your starting point. Because if we're struggling with reality, if we're struggling with not accepting what's happening, it's adding a whole layer of unnecessary struggle and suffering and stress and so on. And so from my perspective, it's better just to be very pragmatic, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, what you can do given this circumstance. And as a corollary for you right now, whatever emotional state you're in is totally fine. So you could be flustered, you could be stressed, you could be upset, you could be depressed, you could be happy. It's okay to be in that state right now and not kind of fight against it. I see that as um, the starting point, the, the point from which you can step forward and get stronger and so on. And I really didn't understand acceptance really until about 20 plus years later. Um, I was very close to a woman in, in medical school whose name is Karen. And um, we had kind of parted paths at end of medical school. And then somehow we got kind of linked together um, through social media. And so we started once a year kind of a Christmas email, the kind of funny things that happened to our kids uh, type thing. And then I got a, an email from Karen in 2006. And she said, Rob, can you give me a call? And immediately thought to myself, um, somebody in Karen's family has a cancer diagnosis. and They want to talk to the body, mind, spirit guy about what they can do. Uh, and so I get on the phone, and her husband answers, and he says, it's actually Karen who has the diagnosis. So she found a lump in her breast and then you know, felt in her armpit and felt a lump in her armpit. By the time I talked to her, she'd actually had the breast removed and the surgery in her armpit and so on. And I was like shocked. This is my friend, my dear friend. By the time she gets on the phone to me, kind of got a frog in my throat, and you know, I'm feeling you know, upset and so on. And she was just so clear, so grounded, so solid and pragmatic in her approach. And I just was just so remarkable. And I said, Karen, like, it just so, sounds so at peace and so clear. And she said, you know, it took me a couple of days uh, to get there, but I've kind of been able to truly accept what, uh, what has happened to me. And it was to the point where uh, her friends had kind of thought that she had given up because she was just like relaxed, you know, she's... She was doing all the appropriate things. She was doing all the medical treatments. She was exercising. She was taking care of herself, all the practical stuff. But she was at a more kind of sense of peace. And so she actually had to write an email to all of her friends to say, you know, this is how I'm viewing this situation. And she was kind enough to share that with me. So I'm going to read from our book um, this issue around acceptance. And the acceptance is the acceptance of one's own mortality. It's really kind of the, the elephant in the room. And so this is what she wrote to her friends. But once I managed to accept that the reality of my mortality had always been there, I could accept that nothing fundamental in my life had really changed with this diagnosis. I'm still the same me. My life has not changed drastically or dramatically. I'm still here. I was not hit by a bus. My loved ones are still around me. Unbelievably, I can honestly say that I'm as happy now as I was five weeks ago. I am, even in this moment, missing a body part or two, hair about to fall out, completely and utterly whole. And then she went on to write, And this allows me to see that the last few weeks and the year ahead as the steps towards rather than a plunge from true wellness. Now, um, and then later in the email, uh, she wrote, I suffered, uh, sorry, I suffered a couple days of despair after this diagnosis. Now that's unusual. Most people are really kind of freaked out of their tree for a month or two. She transitioned very quickly, a couple days. But since then, I've known that I will be okay. Maybe not okay in the way that I would have defined it five weeks ago, but in a bigger sense. I felt that while I cannot be positive that I will beat this, I can be positive that I will have the courage to face what is ahead. I'm positive that I'll have the support from my loved ones, the expertise of my doctors, and ultimately the grace from God to ensure that this turn in the road will not be a negative force in my life. And I believed all that and still believe that from deep within my soul. But in the last two weeks, something else has crept in. 
I'm starting to believe, or want to believe, that I will beat this in the conventional sense. I'm starting to demand it to myself and to ask it of God. There is a proportion of women who survive breast cancer at my stage, so why not me? Right? So what I'm trying to point you to is a tension. I'm trying to point you towards living with the and both, not either or. That she can be at peace, uh, grounded, solid emotionally, and be proactive. Actually take the steps, venture, strive, visualize for something, for healing in some sense uh, there. And that's the tension in a sense I'm going to talk about this evening. This tension of trying to choose the middle road where you're actually holding both sides. And it could be the tension of, you know, we're in this space together and I can feel the energy of the audience and it's something very special right now that I'm feeling. This is sacred space that we're in. And so I can be in this space and I can also plan for the future. So you can be in the moment and plan for the future. You can see yourself as perfectly, in, you know, perfectly imperfect. You can see your foibles and follies and hope to grow psychologically and spiritually. It's that kind of tension between getting and letting and being and doing. We can do both of these as part of our kind of humanity. So there'll be other kind of paradoxes that I want to talk about for, then we get into the kind of more practical type of things. The second thing that Bernie wrote about in terms of his remarkable cancer patients is that his patients no longer viewed recurrence of their cancer or even death as a failure. And yes, I want you to be healed. I want you to have great longevity. I want you to have a fantastic life. But the remarkable cancer patients, these exceptional patients, didn't put their energy into the things they could not control. They put their energies in the things that they could control. Right? So their attitudes, their beliefs, their connection, where they put their energy, what are their priorities, their relationships. You can get into that space, that kind of physiological space of love and connection has an influence in the body, has an influence on the kind of the physical side. So again, that paradox of, yes, I like this outcome, but I'm not going to put my energy there. And I've recently been reading around the, um, it's called Radical Remissions. It's a, it's a book by Kelly Turner. So a PhD that kind of interviewed 100, almost 100 people who's undergone a kind of spontaneous remission. She did the kind of qualitative analysis, and she found nine factors. And I will share you the nine factors as we go through this. But one of the factors that she noticed in all of these people was the strong desire to live. Right? So again, it's a little bit of a paradox. I'm saying accept and strong desire to live. Now, in her initial assessment, she actually, she actually uh, saw the words like, I don't want to die. And then she realized that wasn't quite right. Because many of the spontaneous remission folks, the guys that had these amazing uh, outcomes, many of them actually were not afraid of dying. They said, death is a natural part of life. When I die, I'm going to do this natural transition. So it wasn't like they were living out of fear. It was they, they were living out of sense of purpose and meaning. And so that is what I want, want to share with you as well. Can you find something that is your passion, that is meaningful for you, that wants you to live? Can you tap into that life force energy? as part of this. There are I have a couple other factors before we do something very practical here. Um, so the remarkable cancer survivors, like the happiest people in the world, see the difficulties as opportunities. See uh, the cancer diagnosis as the catalyst for growth. So there's always this kind of sense of reframing. We're going to go through lots of different reframing here. And the last one that, uh, that Bernie described in his book, and he had described others, was his exceptional patients were truly willing to love themselves. Right? So the idea is that we have this amazing body. We have this amazing opportunity to um, you know, express our spirit in the world. So it's best to kind of love yourself as a foundation. And you being a more practical a better space when you actually kind of put on your oxygen mask first. I think that's probably kind of the best analogy. 
And there's some really good kind of scientific data around the fact that if you're compassionate towards yourself, you're actually much more effective in the world. So self-compassion is not selfish. And that's a whole other 20-minute talk uh, tonight. So that was my, introduce, my introduction to um, the remarkable cancer survivors, Bernie Siegel's side. And I've been, trying to, I've been trying to follow that over the decades. I've been trying to follow, trying to figure this out so I can give you this talk tonight that actually provides the kind of science behind that. And then there was Alistair Cunningham, who runs here in Toronto, uh, the Healing Journey program. And he actually did a prospective trial looking at people who had incurable cancers and watching to see those people who are most proactive, who took uh, the greatest amount of uh, attention to their, their health and to, and to uh, did this kind of spiritual, psychological work, were the ones that were most likely to live longest. In fact, it was a factor of three longer for the kind of high involvement uh, folks. And so prospectively, in a kind of more scientific way, we've been able to prove that if you're proactive in your health, you can actually have a better outcome, better result. And Alistair, you know, similar to Bernie, he identified certain attitudes, attributes of his remarkable patients. Uh, and the first one was um, authenticity, meaning authentic to oneself, meaning willing to listen to what's right for you, not having to agree with societal norms or family norms, but listening to that kind of heart space, the quiet voice that can guide you along your healing path. And we're going to get to some practical ways to kind of be able to listen to that intuition. But then he also had autonomy, which is essentially the, um, this idea of actually putting into action. Um, and the third feature was acceptance. So again, he found a very similar um, to, to Bernie Siegel. And the fourth one I say is action. Uh, so those are the four A's that Alistair uh, identified through the, the 90s and early 2000s. So then how do we do this? It's, it's, it's nice to have this philosophy that I'm offering to you, but actually tonight I want to get very, very practical. And it's exciting for me because uh, in the last five years, the kind of brain science is really caught up with what you know intuitively, that the mind really does influence the physiology of the body. And oftentimes, I don't know exactly the mechanism of how the thoughts and beliefs and um, those actions convert into kind of healing. Um, but I don't think it's important necessarily to understand the mechanism. I think it's important to understand what can you do? What's the practical stuff? And so start at the start. So you're, if you're in this space and your goal is to maximize your chance of recovery, if your goal is to kind of come back home um, emotionally, kind of less of the kind of up and downs and the, and the shattering and the displacement and the roller coaster of a cancer diagnosis and kind of come back home to center, and if your goal is to think more clearly and to function better on the day to day, then I want to offer you that practical advice. But start at the start. And the start is to be very clear about what your goal is. To set an intention. How is it that you want to be in this world? What is the kind of space, psychological space? How do you want your, your spirit to manifest in the day to day? And be conscious about it. Because otherwise, you're going to get blown this way and that. In whatever state of mind you practice, you will get better and better and better at. Essentially, it's the principle of what they call neuroplasticity. So if you, if you practice being agitated, distressed, upset, and flustered, the neurocircuitry around that gets stronger and stronger with time. If you practice being more grounded, peaceful, connected, loving, whatever it is that you want to practice, the neurocircuitry on that side will get stronger. So it's either one or the other in some sense. That the brain is in two, two states, either the kind of wise, compassionate state or the stressed, irritable state. But you need to actually practice it. And that's why I think actually setting the intention consciously is so important at the start. So you might hear that as actually prayer. You could also hear it from a kind of Buddhist perspective. But you might just understand it as very practical. And I like, I like the action of setting the intention because I do it two situations. 
One is first thing in the morning, you're going to set your intention first thing in the morning. How is it that you want to manifest your spirit? How is it that you want to be in this world? And so at the end of my meditation, my meditation essentially has two phases. And I'll describe this later. The first phase is mindfulness of breath. And then the second phase for the last maybe three to four minutes, you could call it prayer. Usually it's in secular terms though. So I'm, I'm asking for help. I'm asking for guidance. I'm willing to be the subservient of the higher power or your higher self if you want to use the kind of less religious terms. Like, let me be kind, let me be clear, let me be helpful in this world. This is what I'm praying very hard every morning. That's what I really want to do. Let that come out. So I'm setting that intention first thing. And what I'm hoping is that as I get blown off course, I start to get you know, upset by that comment, I can come back home again. Remember what's most important, right? And so there's the moments where you want to set the intention in, in the fray of life. Right? You're there, you're interacting, you're suddenly saying, oh, I'm getting blown up here. Let's just settle down. Let's come home to what's most important. So to say that prayer first thing, set the intention first thing, is very, very, very powerful. And that's actually what I'd like to do with you right now, is actually spend some time, three to four minutes, of a kind of visualization and then, or a relaxation visualization and kind of setting the intention. So if you would, um, you can put the stuff down in your lap. And I want you to take a posture that's noble and dignified. So pull yourself <laughs> off the back of the chair. And this is how it looks like. Sit up straight. Pull yourself off the back of your chair if you want to. You can participate in the way. So you're taking your seat. You're feeling strong. You're feeling grounded in this moment. And the world will go around us, and that's totally fine. So feet are flat on the ground, the hands on the knees, noble, dignified. You're strong within yourself. Your, your body is telling your psyche that you were strong right now. Feeling of the head being pulled towards the sky. Now we come home, we come home with mindfulness, first of all, just being very curious. What does that feel like? Physically, those watching at home can also do this. Coming home, sense of groundedness in your feet, the weight of the hands on your knees, the weight of the body in the chair. So just be very curious. What does that feel like? You might even feel the kind of energy of your body very, very curious. Bring your attention now to your backbone. Just feel the solidness, the physicality of your humanness. Bring your attention now to the front of your chest. Sense of warmth, sense of openness. Maybe even a rawness, vulnerability. And that's our humanness. It's strong spine. It's the open heart. Now imagine breathing in a sense of calm. So in breath, invite in universal calm. Out breath, relax and release. So continue to breathe at whatever rate is best for you. But just invite in that kind of sense of love and calm into your being, out breath, release, and relax. That universal peace and calm is with you all the time to be drawn on at any moment. And now set up visualization. I want you to begin to br uh, bring a sense of um, caring and compassion level of the heart, level of the middle of your chest. Just allow yourself to feel a real sense of caring. It's easiest probably to bring to mind a loved one, someone who you love dearly or your pet, or maybe at a different time in your life, your 
kids were young and you really loved your kids. But not so much now, I guess. Or, or when you were young, remember your grandmother, your parents. Allow your heart to warm. Or bring to mind somebody in your life who's suffering in some way or form. It could be somebody who's very close to you, family member, partner, friend. It could be somebody that you've seen here at Gilda's from a distance. And again, allow your heart to warm. Extend that sense of calm and peace and connection to everybody here in the room now. Wish them well. May they find healing in whatever way is best for them. And that universal, unlimited healing energy to everybody now who's connected with Gilda's Club, all the people near and far. And now again, anybody who's had a cancer diagnosis in the region, in the country, in the world, anybody who's suffering anywhere, Allow yourself to feel that sense of connection. Send them your good prayers, your wishes for healing. And recognize as you're doing that, sending that loving energy out everywhere, you're sending it towards yourself. That golden energy is washing over all your tissues. You can actually send that to some part of your body. It needs more healing. emotional or psychological problem into your psyche, into your spirit. May I find healing in whatever way is best for me. And from that space of limitless, loving energy, set an intention for yourself. How is it that you want to be? How do you want to spend your precious life energy? What is it that you need to learn tonight? How do you want to be able to walk away? And let it be so. And the chimes. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Well practiced. So please, yeah, whatever posture is best for you, you can. Okay, so I'm feeling a bit more relaxed. <laughs> Settle down. Thank you for your good energy. Yeah. Okay, so the practicality of this. Right, so we have getting the best care from the medical system and then body, mind, and spirit. The two together are marriage called integrative care or what I call complete cancer care. It's what I believe in. And we'll focus body, mind, and spirit and really actually more at the mind or brain level. But it's really... It's one holographic picture, really, in terms of facilitating healing. And so the idea is to work with this brain of yours, this kind of whatever is between the kind of ears, the physicality, the, the, the chemicals, the, the circuitry of the brain and the body. It's one system. In fact, the nervous system goes beyond what's just in your skull, right? There's millions of nerves that are around your gut, around your heart. It's one system. In fact, the hormone system, which is the chemicals that are released on both sides, create one, one solid pathway of healing potential. And so how can you unleash, unleash that? Well, the first idea is to understand that your brain can only be in two states of mind. You're, you've kind of flipped back and forth between these two. So one is what I call the stressed or irritable brain, and the other one is the wise, compassionate brain. It's one or the other at any point in time throughout the day. And it's based on um, evolutionary biology. And i just like to show you the kind of hand model of the brain so it gives you an idea of, of um, what it means. So if the uh, wrist area represents the spinal cord, the first level of the brain that was created in the nervous system some 650 million years ago or thereabouts, is the reptilian brain. It's essentially fight or flight. It's the withdraw from danger type of part of your brain. And so that's part of the stress brain. 
But then the next level of evolution, the next floor that was built within this house, is represented by the thumb, and that's the limbic system, and it's the approach system. Essentially, sex and food were the kind of the approach um, processes there, but it is, it is the more stressed, irritable part of your brain, so that's a stressed brain, partly there. And then the last level of evolution, the next level of built in the house, is you know, mammalian, neo mammalian, very human. We've got a lot of kind of um, real estate up front in the frontal lobes here. And you can see the relative anatomy, right? That the frontal lobes are overlying the irritable brain. And the idea is if you can keep yourself engaged in the frontal lobe, then you kind of soothe those parts of your brains that are more stressed and irritated and kind of nervous. So the idea is to live your life through your frontal lobe and not flip your lid. <laughs> and the whole idea is to try to re-engage all of the time, try to re-engage and stay thinking clearly and wisely. And the same kind of things, the same kind of challenges will, will present you within the world, but when you're living in your frontal lobe, you're more clear thinking. You can think more clearly, uh, you're happier, and you can see more opportunities, and so on. You're, it's, it's the space to be in. This is what you would have kind of visualized as setting your intention. You'd be living out of your frontal lobe. And so there's, there's two ways to try to maximize your chances of staying in the frontal lobe. One is the kind of healthy habits on the day-to-day, -day, the things that you do that enervate your body and your gut and everything, put your physical body in the right position so your frontal lobe can keep on working. And then there's the kind of in the moment kind of uh, stressful events. How do I get myself from being super stressed to kind of settling oneself down in the moment? So, there's the conditions, and then there's the kind of practical uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, scenario. So let's work on the first part of this. So the first part is, what are the things that you can influence that make it much more likely that you'll be living out of your frontal lobe? So as an example, drinking alcohol or lots of alcohol, the kind of, the, you lose the kind of capacity, you lose your inhibitions, and the frontal lobe shuts down. So that's not one that we're going to talk about, but give you an idea of what are the healthy habits that you know, do that and what are the healthy habits that, that prevent you from doing that or lifestyle things. So this is now going to be very conversational. Okay? So we're going to have lots of volunteered answers from the audience. Uh, so what, what influences your frontal lobe in terms of working day to day? Thank you so much. So exercise, 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 uh, so very important. Um, when you exercise, you actually release brain-derived growth factor. So it's a chemical that allows your brain to learn by simply exercising. And I've heard as well, it helps to actually exercise in the morning because that actually releases that chemical for the majority of the day. I happen to like exercising at the end of the day when I'm kind of letting out my frustrations and so on. Exercise preferentially can thicken the left frontal lobe, which is remarkable. And the balance between the left and the right sides actually does produce an overall mood state. Exercise releases the happy hormones. Exercise improves the quality of sleep. Exercise gives you more energy. Exercise improves quality of life. I could really rant on a long time about exercise. It is so very important. But let's make this more enjoyable. Um, can everyone stand up? Okay, so according to your ability, and don't go nuts because Gilda's Club, you know, needs to continue to function here. I want you to do 10 squats to whatever degree feels good for you. <laughs> While we're doing that, I want you to tell me how much exercise do you need to do per week or per day? 30 minutes a day. How hard does it have to be? Moderate. Moderate, yeah, meaning what? Yes, brisk walk, good. Slight sweat. Yes, good. If you've done your 10, you can sit down. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I made you do that because now part of the recommendation is twice per week as part of your 150 minutes to do some type of strength training. And it's 8 to 10 muscle groups using 8 to 10 reps, two sets. So for instance, doing squats would be you know, helping you with your quads and glutes and so on. So that's one of the muscle groups that you would use as part of an exercise there. 
okay, let's get this even more enjoyable. What are some of the tricks that you use in the day-to-day -day that will help you to actually exercise, help you keep going? Say again? Accept, accepting where you are, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and so we start where we're at. Because even though I might say 150 minutes, but if you're feeling quite weak, it might be a, a one-minute walk would be the first starting point. And then not to push oneself and just do what you can. And slowly, like a professional athlete, over the months you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that takes will. That takes um, focus. But also, from my perspective, it's like tell I want to live. From a kind of evolutionary perspective, I think that we lived in tribes for you know, thousands and thousands of years. And if you're out there gathering berries, you're out there you know, uh, hunting down game, then you were this kind of um, multiples of, of survival body. So you by exercise and say, I have to stay alive for my tribe. But even from a psychological or spiritual perspective, uh, it's like, I want to live. I want to get better. So you're using all the kind of frustrations and upsets and all the negative emotions and focus it on something that really makes a difference. Now, interestingly, uh, Kelly Turner's book, Radical Emissions, exercise didn't make the top nine, but she says actually she's doing some more kind of analysis and she's feeling like it was partly because a lot of those people didn't know about exercise in the past and a lot of people were kind of weak at the time of their diagnosis, but now exercise is actually uh, much more prominent amongst the radical remission folks. Okay, so what are the tricks? What are the tricks of the trade that allow you to actually do this? Like, how do you do it? Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Nice. Wonderful. Wow. So having a goal, so for the people at home, having a goal, like, you know, it could be the 5K race could be, I know, 10 months from now type thing. So you slowly kind of work yourself up to it. So it's something there. But also making a date with a friend because we're much more likely to be responsible to our friend than we are to be responsible to ourselves. And there's a nurse at the hospital uh, who had a cancer diagnosis and I treated her. And she has a contract with three friends. Essentially, so each visit her once per week. They each take her to a different kind of exercise activity. So unless she's in a coma, she knows that she's going to be going for exercising. It's just as simple as that. So making it social, making it fun, make it fun. There's so much good stuff and connection and you know, there's so many different ways to kind of get, get out there and do it. But number one is exercise. It really thickens your frontal lobe. You get your muscles, you get your muscles. Okay, so what's number healthy habit number two? This is how your brain works in the day to day. Diet, well done. And specifically, okay, uh, yeah, specifically around brain function, it has to do with sugar levels, right? Because interestingly, this is the high octane part of your brain, meaning it takes more calories per minute to keep your frontal lobe going. When your blood sugar dips, you actually disengage and you work out of your stress and irritable brain partly because it wants you to go and find some food as well, right? And the other part of this from kind of a kind of cancer perspective is the sugary diet, the, um, you know, the pops and the white breads and the, you know, the, unproce uh, the, the processed foods. Usually you get this kind of big uh, peak in the sugar levels and then you get the big crash because the body wants to get the sugar into the cells and so on. And that crash phase also uh, primes lots of other molecules that can prime uh, cancer cell growth. I read something this morning, actually, somebody uh, emailed me something about it was uh, drinking water and, and not eating bacon decrease people's risk of cancer, like worldwide. And the drinking water is kind of staying away from the sugary pop, right? So they, like uh, juice or um, like colas have like that much sugar in terms of a can like that. So it's it's unbelievable, yeah. What, what are some of the other elements of a healthy diet? I want kind of popcorn suggestions. What, eating regularly, yes. So you're gonna keep it, 
what they call, call a low glycemic diet, right? So there isn't the parks, it speaks, and so on. What else is? Yes, plant-based for certain. So you have the kind of uh, micronutrients, plant, uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, I like to have different types of foods at each meal because the micronutrients will combine. In fact, we get to talk about your gut and the bacteria within your gut. So having the plants and fruits also kind of feeds the bacteria that's super important in terms of your health. Um, healthy fluids, obviously. What is the one supplement that we need? Vitamin D, how much? It's between 1,000 and 2,000 is what I've heard. If it's okay, probably 5,000 is okay. You probably get 20,000 when you go into the sun. But um, the, I have my vitamin D bottle beside my uh, ba bathroom sink so that in the morning I see it first thing I pop my pill. So some ways to do that. Okay, so eat food, not chemicals. Mostly plants, not too much. It's probably it. And I always, always say see a dietitian. Gilda's Club has... You know, amazing programs where you can actually learn these things. All right. So what are some of the secrets to you eating a good diet? That eat regular. What else can you do to kind of maximize your chances? Yes. So in even, in even, you know, cook like three meals in one scenario. So you have that healthy food and you can have it for a couple days afterwards. Another uh, trick. Healthy fiber, right? Exactly. So that also uh, decreases the kind of sugar, uh, sugar spikes. Water as well, right? So you have, you know, keep it going, keep it flowing. Any other cue? How about this one? Don't go to the grocery store hungry. Because <laughs> when I'm there, I'm hungry, and it's like suddenly those cookies are looking really good, right? And then if the cookies don't get home, it's really hard for me to eat them. If you do have cookies there, put them in a space that's a little bit more inconvenient and definitely out of sight. Right? Because the limbic system, this system here, is a very powerful system. If you see it, you're more likely to... Uh, we're talking about willpower now. Okay, so diet, extremely important. Num healthy habit number three that really influences brain function. So meditation is number four, which is excellent, and we're going to talk about that shortly. Oh, good. Very good. <laughs> So, uh, so sleep, right? It's obvious when you're tired, you can't think as clearly, you can't plan as clearly, you're more irritable. You, essentially, you're shutting down the high octane part and you're trying to preserve your energy at that point. So we can't force ourselves to have a good night's sleep. We can set up the conditions in which a good night's sleep is more likely to happen. So what are some of those conditions? What are some of those ideas? Dark space, so keep it dark. And even 90 seconds of bright light in the middle of the night will suppress melatonin and other natural hormones that are released during a good night's sleep. So I actually uh, wear eye patches, especially right now, it's like the long days of summer, having the blinds down, having the eye patches down. For me, it means I have to get to bed earlier because the light is waking me up in the morning. It happens every year for myself. So dark, what else do you do? Say again? Yes. Uh, so the idea, so it's, it's the, the quality is of the light. And I'll, 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 I didn't probably get this. Yeah, I, I won't get this right, but I'll, I'll flip it to the, what I want to say, which is stay away from the bad light before bedtime. What's the bad light? <laughs> any screen. Any screen. Don't give yourself the jolt of email. You know, within that last hour, hour and a half of going to bed, don't watch the TV show. Don't, don't, what else don't you do the last couple hours? Exercise too hard, eat a lot of chocolate, you know, alcohol is not good for a good night's sleep. Uh, so there's lots of different ways you can do that. What do you do at 3 a.m.? Bing! And you wake up. You wake up and you're, cata <laughs> and you're, go for a pee, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say, but do the blind person's walk. To go to, because you don't want to turn on the bright lights, right? But what I'm talking about is an insomnia. 3 a.m., you're starting to worry, starting, what's going to happen? What are you going to do? The planning, planning your life. What do you do? Breathing, yes. Okay, so what I suggest is actually practicing a relaxation. Because there's, there's mind body, but there's also body mind, or what I call body up. 
and practicing a relaxation exercise, letting go of the chattering mind. I, I gave a talk I know, a couple weeks ago, and the, uh, the woman says that she actually counts her breaths very slowly on the in-breath and the out-breath, and the focus of having to breathe in for four, maybe breathe out for eight, focuses the mind on the counting such that you, it's hard to catastrophize at the same time, right? So, and I say when you're breathing slowly and the body begins to relax and then the mind can naturally more relax. And I just, I put up with the boredom of having to be awake in the middle of the night. Typically it takes me a couple hours to get back to sleep, but then I actually do to get a couple hours and that's better than getting up and, and you know, stimulating my, all, the, all the rest of the stuff that can happen. Okay, how about this? Uh, napping good or bad? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're having a poll here. Time, I, I, time, I say time depends as well. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on the thumbs up. In fact, I had a nap at Gilda's Club here this afternoon. I'm feeling a whole bunch better. Thank you, Katie and team. Um, so before 5 p.m., Probably 15 minutes is probably a good period. I think if I can get into some RAM, it really helps me. And I actually think you can catch up on your sleep uh, by having naps. If you nap, your brain's better able to learn, for instance, motor skills and some memory work and so on afterwards. I think it works for me. And I, the data from my mind is that people have a better quality of sleep that night if they nap, and they wake up more rested the next morning. I think that's uh, the data there. OK, so there's sleep. The fourth one we had, which is practicing a meditation or a relaxation. And in fact, why don't we stand up for a second here, just because I, I know we we'll want to do a little bit of qigong right now. And so the idea is to imagine shoulder widths apart, kind of a um, little bend in the knees, gunslinger. You're in a beautiful vat of smooth beautiful water, warm, beautiful water, and breathe in through raising, raising your arms up like a zombie, and then breathe out through your mouth on the way down. Let's do that like four more times. Breathing in through your nose, and out through your mouth. Now bring your mindfulness to your body. Be very conscious of your body. Breathing in. Pay close attention to the exercise. And one more. Excellent. Have a sit. Thanks, folks. So I put you through a little bit of qigong just to say that the relaxation exercise does not have to be kind of classic breath meditation, mindfulness meditation. It could be walking meditation. It could be qigong. It could what we just did. Uh, it could be a body scan where you list visualization. Lots of different ways of bringing your attention back. And the, and the data is very, very strong around the power of meditation and how it improves attention, uh, be, being able to attend to what's happening. It improves emotional regulation, right? So this guy, the stress irritable brain is going, and, the, and the, this part saying, you're OK. You're OK. Settle down. I don't have to go there. Right? So emotional regulation. And just creativity and a kind of sense of openness is much more powerful in people who um, practice meditation. And I want to share my meditation experience, because I've heard like, just a thousand times people say, I can't meditate. My mind goes a thousand miles per hour. And I'd say to you, that's good. There's lots of opportunities to practice the skill of bringing your attention back. So you're actually in a good space to learn this. But let me just um, try to explain it. So most mornings, including this morning, it was only five minutes this morning, I bring my attention, I sit on the mats, kneel on the mats, bring my attention to my breathing. And within about three seconds of starting, I'm starting to think about what I need to do. Are we going to be late to the airport? You know, build this club, that sounds like a good time, blah, blah, blah. And at some point in time, I recognize that I'm thinking and I bring my attention back to breathing. And within about three seconds of that, I'm thinking about what happened yesterday at that departmental meeting. So 
I was in a really quiet moment there, and I cracked this joke, and nobody's laughing. It's like, why don't I just shut up? It's so stupid. And so at some point in time, I recognize that I'm thinking, and I bring my attention back to breathing, and I'm off again. And, you know, this is, like, I'm 20 years into meditating. This is 20 years later. And it's, a, it's been a very similar experience for 20 years. Um, and yet, I know it's had a profound influence on how I feel. Um, yes, most mornings I get that, oh, yeah, it's centered, oh, grounded. I'm in my body. I'm feeling relaxed and so on. Um, but I know the days that I meditate, I'm actually in a more calm and peaceful space. I feel like I'm kind of walking in the world very clearly without having to, there's, there's a lot less kind of struggle and stress around it. I'm just doing what I need to do. I think I'm more efficient. And I also feel more compassionate. I like can look that person in the eyes and really kind of connect with them. Uh, and so all the things that I'm talking about kind of scientifically actually manifest in my life. And as the years went by, I recognized that um, um, that it's actually meditating throughout the day. Uh, that I'd be in a conversation, I'd be talking with somebody, and then it'd be like thinking about what I need to do after work. And I recognize I'm actually not even listening to them and bring my attention back into the conversation again. So I'm bringing my attention back. And it's that muscle of bringing your attention back that you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger, recognizing. So the guys that have a lot of thoughts have lots of chances to kind of come back home again. So meditation, very, very powerful way. And in fact, it, it, it feeds right into our kind of next, um, next teaching, which is around stress. Because when you're in that more grounded, solid state, you're actually much more resilient. It's as if you know, the people are throwing arrows at you, but it's just, they're, just not, they're zinging by. They're just kind of not sticking, so to speak. Uh, so you're kind of the water off the duck's back because you're in that more calm state of mind. And that's what I would call from the first level is kind of resetting your stressometer. So you can be in this world and be agitated and upset and flustered and you're kind of you know, living the world, walking through the world like this. Or you can be more grounded, peaceful, clear thinking as a ground state and less of the kind of dips up and down. So you, you do that by practicing that through meditation. You do that by practicing it in the moment. So first, um, the first teaching around stress is to be able to recognize your own stress reaction, to be able to recognize uh, when you're getting yourself flustered, when you're getting yourself upset. Because the earlier that you recognize, the easier it is to kind of settle yourself down. Um, and so I want you to bring to mind a time, maybe in the last week or month or year, whatever, when you really were feeling stressed and upset or angry, flustered, distressed, you know, could be walking into a physician's office or something at work or something at home, kids being disrespectful, um, something that's happening within your life when you're really flustered, upset, angry, stressed. Okay, have that memory? Imagine that you could press the pause button, boom, in the midst of it, when you're really upset, really, you know, wound up. Press the pause button. What are the physical things that are happening in your body at that moment of high degrees of stress and anxiety? You tell me. Hearts, yeah. Pumping heart. Sometimes yeah, it can be big breaths or it can be like stuck breaths. <gasps> kind of like stuck up. Can't breathe. Muscle tension. and can come out in different ways. Come out as headache, neck ache, back ache, jaw. I get the kind of, like my jaw muscles get really tight. It could be what? Sweaty palms, dry mouth, acidy stomach, diarrhea, you've got to go to the bathroom, kind of shakes and jitters, right? So any of those could be cues. What happens, how would you describe the emotional, the emotion of that situation for you? Anger, yeah. So it could be like seeing red, you want to put your fist through the computer screen. What else could, could you experience? Tears. Tears. So it could be like crying. It could be sadness. It could be dissociation. It could be like you know, not feeling anything, like a numbness. Overwhelmed. overwhelmed, yeah. The overwhelmed or anxious, scared feeling. Okay, so those could be the cues. What happens to your thinking? 
confused, irrational. Sometimes you can see the rabbit in the, sorry, the, um, the mouse in the hamster cage, whatever, hamster wheel, right? This is kind of perseverating or getting very narrow. What's the content of the thinking? What's the actual negative? negative? Yeah, so it could be negative. Imagine that there was a magical computer program that could type out everything that you thought for 24 hours. At the, end of, at the end of 24 hours, you go back and you read over the transcript. How would you know from the words and sentences, oh, I was stressed out at that point? What would be the content? So for me, if I'm swearing, if the swear words are coming out in my thinking, right, or I'm calling people's names, the blame game, that guy is such a beep, beep, beep. Or if I'm calling myself, I'm labeling myself, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I did that. The kind of negative, harsh self-talk. Right? So any of those. And the reason I'm trying to get you to kind of think about all this is that any one of those could say, oh, I've kind of wound myself up here. And now I want to teach you the technique of kind of getting yourself back to yourself, getting yourself back home again. Uh, and in fact, why don't we stand up again? You can get your exercise tonight just from all the standing and so on. So imagine that you're in and at the time you don't have off my actually have some time to or you decide how you want to respond to the situation. For the most part, right? Hands on the lower abdomen. So you're in that stressful situation. The first thing that you're going to do is flip yourself up into your front lobe by becoming very curious about the physical sensations in your body. It's called interoception. What does this feel like right now? Right? So what does it feel like to be in your body right now? Without the judgment, without the thinking, without the labeling, just be very curious. So immediately you're up into your frontal lobe. Now I want you to take four slow breaths deep down into your abdomen. And try to do a longer, slower out breath. So it's very relaxed, but very smooth. Nice, deep, slow breaths. Nice and slower, longer out breath. Okay, so then at that point, you can now reassure yourself, I can handle this. Let's take this one step at a time. I've been through this before. I can do this. Good, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Really appreciate that. So I really want to um, kind of reteach you this, because this is, this, is this is a practical and effective method of settling down your physiology, of actually kind of coming back home, re-engaging your frontal lobe, so that you can actually think and make good decisions as to what you want to do. Right, so recognize it early. Oh, pounding hard, or oh, I'm feeling flustered. Oh, I just swore in my mind, or whatever it is, whatever the cue is, press the pause button. And then you want to let go of the catastrophizing mind. It's the thoughts that are driving the stress reaction. And your body knows no difference between a real stress reaction and the thoughts that are driving a stress reaction. So you want to let go of that for a moment. You, you're going you're to reattach with your rational mind in a moment. You're going to draw on your knowledge and your wisdom. But for now, let go of all the possibilities, all the stress-inducing stress ideas. And just get very curious. What does it feel like to be physically in my body right now? It takes about 90 seconds usually for the, the hormones to flush through the system. So it, it might take a little while to kind of settle down the physiology. But as soon as you become very curious around your physicality, boom, you're automatically into your frontal lobe. You can practice the four slow breaths, slower, longer out breath. Out breath is related to the relaxation part of the nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. You can even, you know, touch your cheek or touch your skin, actually send some oxytocin there. But the lower, longer out breath settles you down and then you can actually use your rational, wise mind. Right? So you can, you can reassure, I can handle this. I can do this. Let's, 
one step at a time. Maybe that's when the, the reframing comes through. So, so that's the kind of classic stress. You know, we want to reduce our stress levels. And when you're really stressed, it makes sense. But I want to take you to the kind of next level of teaching in stress. Because what's your, what's your relationship to stress, right? So when you see yourself <gasps> flustered, upset, agitated, what are you saying to yourself about yourself? You're saying, oh, this is really bad. My life is toxic. I want to get this from happening. Right? So in some sense, they, that relationship is an antagonistic relationship, and you're adding more tension and kind of judgment onto the situation. And what I'm going to suggest to you now is that your relationship to stress will actually change how your brain works. So instead of saying, this is bad, I really want to settle myself down, you say, ah, I'm feeling stressed, something important's at stake. I can learn from this and I can make good decisions or whatever. So it's, it's like the, the self-talk to say that actually stress can be helpful will change how your brain works. So instead of fighting it, you garner the stress. Instead of trying to calm yourself down, you say, the stress can help me think more clearly. And there's good data around the scientific studies that that change in attitude changes brain function. And I'll give you the example from uh, some studies uh, related to what they call the social stress test. And the social stress test is meant to make people feel stressed and anxious and upset. And it's usually related to public speaking. So they make people public speak and they humiliate them on top of it. They mock them on top of it. And to a person, it's very stressful to go through this experience because we're so wired I mean, why is it that we feel stressed when, you know, through a public talk? Because the circuitry around this fight or flight is being activated by a higher part of our brain. So uh, the study that I'll describe, and there's lots of different uh, variations in this, were, was Columbia business students were asked to give a five-minute persuasive speech. And so they're really excited. And they're going to be videotapes and cameras and lights and so on. And their videos are going to be assessed by potential employers to see how good of a candidate would they be for their jobs and so on. So they're super excited and they have the, um, uh, the judges are all set up in a line and so on. And so they come in and they start giving their speech. Now, unbeknownst to the students, the judges are taught how to mock them. And sometimes it's Stonewall. Sometimes it's like whispering and snickering and looking at your watch. But in this particular one, it was like per the students like talking, doing the speech. And the first judge says, stop, stop, stop. Your body language is all wrong. Come on, stand up. Look me in the eye. You can do better than that. Keep, continue. And so the guy's going on like this. And then the next judge jumps in and says, oh, that was a terrible example. That's a really weak example. You have to think of a better example. Like, keep, keep on going type thing. And so to a person, and sometimes they would make them do like mental math on the spot. So in fact, why don't we do this? It would be really fun <laughs> for me. OK, so take 900 and subtract 7 and keep giving me the answer. So 900, 893, keep coming. You guys aren't very good at math, are you? <laughs> must, be, uh, must be from Toronto, Toronto folks, yeah? OK, fair enough, good enough. So you get the idea that no matter how good, no matter how good they do their math, they get mocked. And again, it causes a stress. So all of them are suffering from a stressful experience. Now, the experimentation was half of the students Listen to a three-minute video that basically said, um, stress is really bad. It decreases your performance. We want to avoid stress. It's bad for your health. You know, the classic stuff that I thought was true for 25 years. Half the students heard a, a video that says, there's a new science to stress that you can actually garner the energy of your stress reaction. When you feel your heart pounding hard, you're actually, it's energizing you. And if you feel short of breath, you're getting more oxygen to your brain. It's helping your brain think more clearly. There, you know, stresses actually can be very good for you. And they measured the differences between the two students, half of them getting the stresses bad, half of them getting stresses enhancing. The students that had the stresses enhancing video were more confident, more determined, more excited, more likely to be hired by blinded assessors. And not only that, they measured a chemical that's released in their brain called DHEA, 
which in the lower part of the body is a precursor to testosterone. So when you exercise, you release this DHEA and your, your, your muscles get stronger. In your brain, you release DHEA in response to stressful situation so that you can think more clearly and learn from a stress reaction. Right? So it's actually helping you. So when you put yourself in the mindset, ah, this is stressful, but I can learn from this. You know, um, something important is at stake here. I need to focus and my stress reaction can help me. When you think that, then you release this chemical and your brain works better. So a simple change in attitude will actually have you think and perform more easily. So that, that one's a cue, definitely, I want you to take away. So when you're in that stressful situation, something important's at stake. I can, I can learn from this. I can use the energy of my stress reaction to perform better. Simply saying that to yourself will get you in a better space. The other thing that's released during a stress reaction is oxytocin. There are other chemicals there, but oxytocin you would recognize as the cuddle hormone. It also is anti-inflammatory. So it actually decreases inflammation within the body, which has its benefits in lots of different ways. And oxytocin also drives pro-social behavior, which essentially means, I think of it as like the man cold. Right? You know the guys that get bad at cold and they're like, oh, I feel so bad, take care of me. I think, I think it's actually oxytocin that's driving it. Because from a tribal perspective, when you're weak, you want your tribe members to take care of you. So you're like, oh, help me, type thing. From your perspective, when you're suffering from a stressful situation, you can prime yourself through oxytocin by doing two things. Offer to help somebody else. So find meaning by giving back or ask for help, right? And that will release those chemicals that are helpful. The fourth level here, and I'm, I'm gonna keep you a while tonight because I want to teach you. I'm sorry if you're gonna be a little bit bored at points, but this is so important, I want you to get all the, all the teaching. The fourth level is actually reframing. Actually, going to the source of the stress. What are the core beliefs that are driving that whole system? Like, why am I flustered or upset or angry in those situations? What can I learn about myself so that I can look at life in a bigger perspective? And so there's a technique that's basically co um, called cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Really good data, randomized data that shows that if you can, if you can change how you think, you will feel better. And we're, not, we're not talking about putting on a happy mask. I'm talking about being creative and open and wise in your response to situation. And the most obvious example from CBT is people who are depressed often start with the thought, I'm no good, I'm inadequate, I'm a loser, whatever it is, some variation of that. And that leads to the kind of depression. And if they can reframe the truth is, we all have inherent beauty and wisdom. If we can actually embrace that truth, that would change the perspective and they would be much more, less likely to be depressed. So the kind of thinking side is, um, is, uh, is very powerful. And Rico, I'm wondering, uh, maybe I do have control of the slides still. So, um, so this, is the, this is the combination of using your wisdom and your compassion. It's both sides, the both kind of wise parts of your brain to feel better. And it's based on um, a classic book called Feeling Good, which is the basis of this cognitive behavioral therapy. And in a summary, this is it. You change your mind, you work on your cold beliefs, and ultimately you get to the bottom, which is you feel better, you're emotionally stronger, you're more productive, and you just, you're just your best self. And you're working towards your best self by using this technique. It's a three-column technique that we teach during the weekend retreats. And essentially, you'll see up top is the situation, which is just the raw truth of the situation. So the raw truth is, I'm standing here talking to you, and you could be having some thoughts about you know, the situation. I know this is boring now or whatever. It could be the thoughts about the situation. And if you could recognize that your thinking is kind of exaggerated, distorted, that the, this thinking causes the problem, that you can start to reframe this through awareness. And ultimately, by using the kind and wise part your brain to acknowledge, to look at the situation in a different perspective, and to be encouraging of oneself. So, and a whole like, about quarter of the book there is about teaching you this skill. 
So let's take it through a, a specific example. It's probably the easiest way to go at this. So um, this is a scenario. Uh, a woman has breast cancer. She's in the midst of chemotherapy and um, she's going for cure. And she's physically tired and she's emotionally irritable. So there's, there's not a judgment there. It's just that's the facts of the situation. On top of that, she's going to add herself some extra suffering. And we're, what we're going to try to do is to reframe the extra unnecessary suffering. And so on top of her already difficult situation, she's going to have the following thought. It's no use. I don't have the strength to get through this. Right? And so if she could recognize this thinking, then she'd actually start to reframe that. And so we take that into the second column. So you tell me, what emotions will follow this way of thinking? Negative, and how would you describe the emotions? Yes. Sadness. Discouraged, despair, yeah, hopeless, right? What happens to the body when she feels that way? It actually, will, she'll get weaker and weaker and weaker, right? So she's actually causing herself to be physically weaker through her emotional thought. Is it helpful or harmful? Harmful. In what way is it exaggerated or irrational? Right? So if you, if you were a lawyer in this court of law and saying, well, you're actually not quite right in terms of what you thought here from a kind of logical perspective. Empiricity, it is working at With each course of chemotherapy, she's actually improving her chances of cure, which is the truth. Go ahead. She is actually. She is actually getting through this, and I'm choosing a situation where it is appropriate for her to continue on her chemo. It's not like she's so weak that they should stop the chemo. She is getting through this, but I think what's happening here, she's trying to do all her chemo in the next five minutes, right? right? So she's causing a lot of extra distress there. Now, the kind and rational response um, is all happening internally. It's the wise grandmother part of your brain or the wise coach part of your brain, you're going to talk to yourself in this kind of kind way. And if, it, if that's hard to do, then imagine that you were this woman's best friend. How would you talk to her? What's the how part of the talking? Uh, yeah. Yes, it's, you normalize, right? You say, this is tough right now. I hear you. Like, are you going to come into your friend's place and say, suck it up, buttercup. Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's what your relationship is with her. But anyways, you're going to be kind. You're going to say, like, oh, you know, this is a really tough situation. So it's the acknowledgement. And then, and then some of the kind of practical stuff starts to come through. Let's just take this a moment at a time, right? You'll probably feel better tomorrow. It's that type of, that type of feeling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll just uh, offer the reframe we came up with. Not that it's better at all? This is more like just a different way of kind of looking at this. Who says you always have to be strong? Sometimes to cry and fall apart is the best thing to do. And it seems I find an inner strength or higher power. So it's almost like, just relax a little bit into this. You'll probably feel better tomorrow. But there's no kind of no harshness to that. And that you kind of relax into something that's bigger than that. Okay, so th that's an example of how a reframe works. Same situation, but you can kind of see how you have a different kind of feeling around that. Okay. Um, I want to uh, take you through one more technique um, before we get on to the, the last section. And this last technique is called taking in the good. And essentially, it's the idea that our, our brains are wired to, to learn from negative experiences. And, and so we let ourselves perseverate in the negative, and it changes the circuitry of our brains. And if we, can, if we can just see the reality of the situation a little bit more clearly and accentuate the positive a bit more, be a bit more grateful, we'd actually balance this out. So it's the idea of taking in the good. Um, so just you, can, you don't have to put your stuff down, but I do want you to try to visualize this right now so you can kind of close your eyes if you want to. And I want you to, first of all, think about a state of mind that you like to produce more of in your life. So if you want to feel more peaceful, more grounded, more uh, happy, more whatever, um, grateful, more connected, I just want you to 
think of a state of mind that you want more of in your life. Now bring yourself back to some experience that you've had in the past where you were in that state of mind. So you want, I'm going to have you relive this visually, uh, as visualization. So when you were in that positive state of mind, what were you experiencing? What's happening? What did you see? Who was there? Were you by yourself? What was the environment? What did, your, what did you hear? What did your skin feel like? What was the temperature? What did it feel within your body to be in that state? Imagine now that now that you're in that state of mind, that you're now having that state of mind absorb it's kind of um, being left in your heart, left in your spirit, left as a do, feeling. Uh, wonderful. So you can come back too. Um, uh, so you can just look and look up front if you want. So that was probably 25 to 30 seconds. Somewhere in there, we probably did it. And what I, in a sense, forced you to do was to stay in that state of mind. Because typically what's happening is that we have a positive, you know, like I'm walking outside, looking at the blue sky, and it's like, wow, it's beautiful to be here in Toronto. It's just a fabulous city, and it just feels wonderful to be connected with the old stomping grounds and so on. And then... You know, something else happens and my mind kind of gets um, you know, pulled off in another direction. But I don't actually spend the time to experience the kind of sense of gratitude and peace and joy that I feel. And my mind is so fast going this way and that, that it never has a chance to actually go into the machinery of the brain, kind of get stuck down into the neurocircuitry. Whereas the negative experience is somebody you know, cuts me off in traffic, and <gasps> you know, I could have died in traffic there, and then I'm thinking about that. So it happened for like a second, and then I'm, I'm stuck with that feeling for hours, and that's the negativity bias, that that's getting, <gasps> this is a dangerous city, you know, like that, that thing. Whereas in order to balance the playing field, when you have those positive states of mind, stay there. Stay in that state for 15 seconds. And you want to do that five times a day. Wow, is it ever great to be alive? Ah, oh, I love this feeling. Stay there. And I did, you know, I had you experience it in different ways so that your mind would stay in that state of mind. And that circuitry will get stronger and stronger. And like writing a gratitude journal, you will actually begin to see the world in a different way and you'll be much easier to get into that state of mind. Okay, I'm going to finish off with a little reading. And really, it's around this, the idea that, um, you know, we've been talking about mind and kind of the practical ways uh, that we can use the mind, and that our core beliefs often power um, what we're feeling. And that I just want to kind of point to the idea that we can look at the world from a sense of spirit, a sense of, um, of like, the observer consciousness that watches me meditate. And the quality of that observer consciousness is very positive, very energized, very peaceful. Uh, and so when we tap into the kind of spiritual aspect, that can then permeate into the mind level, which has the settling effect, which can permeate then into the body level. So and it, it kind of like um, having a cancer diagnosis can be like walking down the beach during a hurricane. So on the East Coast, we have these powerful hurricanes sometimes. And so a cancer diagnosis can be like you're walking along the beach and the, the wind is blowing in your face and you're, you've got salt in your eyes and you're staggering and the waves are crashing and you're wet to your skin and, you know, it's very turbulent, like kind of at the psychological level, right? So having a cancer diagnosis can be very, uh, very, very difficult psychologically. But that same hurricane is viewed from above, like three or four miles up. You see this beautiful swirl of cloud which is, kind of represents a kind of spiritual level. Or being 20 or 30 feet below the ocean, looking up and seeing the waves crashing, it's very peaceful being there. And so we can experience both of those at the same time. You can experience um, 
you know, the rawness, the sadness, the difficult bankers, the stress, frustration, and you can hold that, you hold your experience with something that's much greater, okay, a sense of wholeness, a sense of connection, sense of peace, sense of spirit that can hold all that. And so those can be concurrent experiences. There's the and both again. And so uh, in that spirit, I just wanted to um, read from a chapter in our book around this issue of spirit. It's a story of my grandmother. On the eve of my grandmother's 110th birthday, I got a call from her nursing home that she was having chest pain. So 110. Wow. Yeah, yeah. At age 100, she was so well that she got kicked off the nursing home list. <laughs> Imagine that. Sorry, honey, like you're at the back of the line. Yeah. I was worried she was having a heart attack and wouldn't make it to the big celebration that was being organized for the next day. That would be a shame because my grandmother was an amazing woman in many ways. She lived in her own apartment until 107, composed poetry up until her final months, and was an exceptional conversationalist with her many visitors. At 109, she pledged to herself that if she made 110, she'd dance on the tables. <laughs> now, her health did go down during that year, and she's mostly in the bed and up to the wheelchair and so on. Anyways, I was worried about her not making 110. I rushed over to the manor to see how sick she was. When I got to her room, I could hear the sounds of a lively violin coming from her room. Three of her great-grandchildren, who were all excellent musicians, were serenading her with songs both lively and poignant. Forgetting about the symptom of chest pain which brought me there, I sat back and listened. The lyrics of one soft song started with, The birds have flown away. Listening to the beautiful harmony of their young voices, I began to quietly cry, realizing that this would be one of the last memories I'd have of this extraordinary woman. Grandma lay in her bed with a smile as broad as her face. As a doctor, I had told that her body was very weak and she would not live much longer, but there she was, looking so happy, at peace, and absorbing every moment to the fullest. And more than that, there seemed to be a glow emanating from her that lit the room with warmth and joy. I've experienced that same feeling at the bedside of many people who have released themselves into something so deep and mysterious that their inner light was obvious to everyone. Whenever this has happened, I've walked away from a simple conversation lighter on my feet and with the feeling that my heart had been stretched open. My grandmother reminded me that a deep connection to spirit is possible even as the body is fading away and turning to dust. Over my years as a doctor, I've seen many of my patients who were able to let go into the spiritual realm, no longer identifying so closely with their bodies or even their personalities. Something like a pain crisis might dim the light, but once the pain was under control, it could settle their minds, the brilliant light of their spirit could shine through again. I remember a young mother treated during her initial breast cancer diagnosis and again after her cancer recurred. She had such an exuberance for life regardless of her physical health. She had to delay her initial radiotherapy session because she had torn open the mastectomy sutures during a snowball fight with her kids. Yeah, she's pretty spunky, that one. Years later, when she was in this terminal phase of her life, I saw her again when she needed radiotherapy. Walking into her room, I could tell that her body was frail her skin yellow from cancer in the liver, but her face glowed and her eyes were filled with deep love. Though too weak to get up to greet me, she extended her arms up for a hug. Her voice rang out, Dr. Rutledge, I'm so happy to see you, as I leaned over for a long embrace. She held not a hint of bitterness about her situation, and I walked away from the clinic that afternoon with a lightness in my heart and an aspiration to share my love with others. When we slow down and are mindful of the true beauty of life, we can become more aware of the realm of spirit. It's here all the time, yet so obvious we can overlook it. I'm truly grateful to my grandmother and so many of my patients who've lit the way, showing me the light of the living spirit even as their bodies were fading away. Yes, as it turns out, my grandmother's chest pain resolved that night and at the party the next day, she conspired with two large men to place her wheelchair up into a large wooden table. <laughs> She had everyone in attendance sing songs to her like, I'm tired and I want to go home. And all the time, her legs jigged and kicked in rhythm on the table. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this, yeah, there's my grandmother, my granddaughter. Yeah. And almost as good as that. <laughs> <laughs>
our new book. No. Uh, so uh, it's, um, it's the healing circuits, uh, the teachings from a weekend retreat. So kind of body, mind, spirit, the whole stuff. And then every second chapter is a story of somebody who's attended the weekend. Um, $20, cash, credit, check, whatever. Two for 40, special tonight. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I'm very, very happy to spend some time and actually have some Q&A um, and also whatever works for you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Anybody have a question? It could be about the medical system, it could be body, mind, spirit. Something that's on your mind. Mm. Yeah, so um, uh, so the question was uh, how do we how do we, how can we tap into our higher self, the kind of the best self when we're in the midst of pain, right? Because pain really does change the perception of the world. And um, you know, just first of all, to honor that sometimes life is very, very difficult. And to have that kind of compassionate um, voice, that compassionate feeling it help, is helpful. And yes, we want to do the practical things, you know, get the medical care, et cetera. In fact, I, I was talking with one of my patients recently, and she'd you know, she got her radiotherapy, we're thinking about some surgery for her, we're changing her narcotics, we're adding some extra stuff. And I said, well, what are some of the other things? You know, could there be a TENS? Could there be uh, acupuncture? Could there be visualization? Could there be, you know, so there are other ways to kind of distract the, the brain from experiencing the pain. Um, and the other one I would just say, just generally speaking, is uh, if we can find meaning in our life, Sometimes just to be able to say, yes, I'm suffering this, but I really love my grandkids and I really enjoy time with them and I want to stay well for my grandkids. You know, so it, it can be kind of one of those bigger philosophical questions. But the first thing is just to say, yeah, this is really, this is tough. You know, this is a tough situation to go through and to, uh, and to find you know, the tricks that help and you know, are the things that, are, that can we be grateful in the midst of the difficulties. So. But that's not an easy that's not an easy issue in any way or form. So bless you. Thank you. Go ahead. So one of oh, it's on. okay, sorry. So one of the things that I've kind of come across in my reading is obviously how bad stress is. Mm. Um and you you've touched on it. Um uh but the reality of life is that we can't really escape stress. Um and I went through a situation where, you know, I, I finished my treatment in November of 2016, and this year I was faced with a very close family member dying of cancer mm. in the hospital I was treated in, yeah. which was enormously stressful. Right, yeah. um, and I guess, and, and not good for me. Mm. Like, it, it wasn't yeah. a good yeah. experience to go through. I, yeah. I knew I was kind of paying a price mm. for being for there. For being there, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Like how much should we just, I know we can't always shelter ourselves right. from stress and some of it is completely unavoidable. Right. Like you're walking down the street and someone, you know, Cut bumps you into yeah. you or yeah. cuts off. But like situations that we know are very triggering, that we know are very difficult, mm. that we know if we put ourselves into yeah. are going to be very hard on us. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you deal yeah. with that? Yeah. How, how, do how do you work with that? Um, so I'm just going to stand back here because I think that's where the cameras uh, are. So really the question is around when we go through the most difficult stuff and it's been traumatic in some sense, because really what we're, what we're describing is a cancer diagnosis can really shatter a person's expectations and really shatter a person's ego state. So that can be traumatic in and of itself. And then life continues to go on, right? And then that, you know, the next situation of having to be with uh, a loved one who's going through that awful experience can also trigger that again. And um, again, it's, it's kind of back to kind of honoring, you know, that was really difficult. And I can offer you some kind of trite uh, types of, um, some trite types of advice, but just to re recognize them, I'm not going to be able to address the kind of the deeper issue uh, there. 
you know, when we go through the difficulty, it's, it's almost as if our heart is being stretched. It, the pain hurts. It stretches the heart. But that's also the part of the heart that allows us to experience more joy. And so that kind of reframe of, yes, that was tremendously difficult, but I also see life as extremely precious. Right? So if you, can, if you can get yourself into the space of, yeah, that was extremely awful, but now I have this now, and so therefore I can be a little bit more grateful for what I have uh, right now. And then the other one maybe is I, I can offer, offer this, uh, this tale as a kind of anecdote, uh, anecdote in some sense. So the, this is a North American First Nations uh, story. The teenage boy approaches his grandmother. The grandmother is near the end of her life. And he says to her, um, Grandmother, how is it that you're so kind and wise and generous and people just want to be in your company and you're so loving? It's just, you know, you're, you're, you're such an amazing person. And um, the grandmother uh, said, you know, when I was your age, when I was a teen, I recognized that there were two wolves in my heart the wolf of love and the wolf of fear. And depending on which wolf I fed would be the wolf that would grow throughout my lifetime. So I tell you that because we all have the capacity to grow our hearts, to grow the wolf of love every day. And it's no matter what age you're at, your brain continues to grow and change and so on. And so you will heal. You have the capacity to heal from the trauma of going through both of those kind of experiences together. But it's also the tale for all of us that we have the capacity to practice the states of mind and so we'll be happier and stronger. And as we practice this, we'll kind of extinguish uh, you know, the, the deep traumas. And grief, including grieving going through a trauma, takes time. It's like it takes a full year to, to grieve and go through and psychologically grow from that. And the last kind of piece of advice is Stress is, 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 um, is detrimental if it's meaningless, if we feel isolated, and if there's nothing that we can do about it. And so to that I always say, we can always reframe and say, I learn from that. I can get stronger from that. And I can also share it with other people. I can also um, you know, share with my friends, my loved ones, saying, I, I feel really badly. It was really difficult to go through that. And by simply telling your truth, being open and honest, it is actually healing and, uh, and, and so on. And this also gives me <laughs> one chance, um, because I came into Gilda's Club uh, this afternoon, and I was just almost in tears, because just the wonderful programming here. It's just an amazing place. Um, but I went to the one room, which was the Jack Layton room, and on it is the kind of stitched um, speech. And he wrote and gave that final speech, love is better than anger, hope is better than fear, and optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, right? The two wolves in the heart are the two functions of the brain. So yeah, thank you. Do you have another question? It could be something very straightforward. Many years ago, I attended one of your conferences. I recognize you. Bonjour encore. Yeah, yeah I remember you were with Les Nassman. Yeah. From the, you, the other doctor yeah. who was like Les Nassman. Yeah. But I, I was frustrated recently. I've shown this to the crew here. And this is kind of my, let's open it. And you'll see the, you know, we hear cancer. Wow. See what it says here. So if you're, you hear cancer, everybody's yeah. sad for you. But if you sure can around. You sure can do a sure lot of can. other stuff. You can be loving, understanding. People judge you because we have cancer, but I, and that's because of you. It's like a 360 degree, because yeah. here I am. You sure can. It's amazing. There's, there's radical remission. We'll be chatting later, right? Thank you. Wow, I'm, now I'm in tears. <laughs> Dr. Rob, how different is the process and what you're speaking about now, someone who's going through cancer versus someone who's gone through cancer, mm -hmm. has not had their grieving process, mm -hmm. and later in life has been affected by 
tumors mm. or any other repercussions that have come along? Mm. Well, see, this talk is actually not about cancer. I, I think you probably recognize it. It's about being human, right? And we all bring our perfectly imperfect selves into every situation. And so I, I see this as a healing journey. Like at, at, no, at every single phase of, of our lives, we have this opportunity to learn and grow. So whether it's the cancer diagnosis, whether it's the unmet grief, whether it's the re-traumatization, whether it's the next challenge, you know, it's, it's one healing journey is how I see it. And uh, that we can choose to bring more love into the world. You know, love versus fear. So I'm hoping that that's helpful in some way or form. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really, and I, do, I don't differentiate it. You know, I, we hear in the weekend retreats, uh, you know, somebody would make a comment like, oh, you guys are having a, a harder time than I am. It makes my troubles seem less. I, I don't buy that. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't commute, compute for me at all. It's like, we're all human. We're all having these experiences. It's this kind of, this thing that's going through us, this life that's going through us, is, um, you know, it's, it's not differentiated. It's, it's all opportunity. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the DVD, I'm not very good at promoting my own stuff, so I'll, I'll give you commission. Um, it's a three track set. Uh, one is um, uh, the Qigong that we did together, 18 minutes, very, very popular. Uh, the second one is very gentle yoga, and the third one is just kind of pure meditation. So, uh, yeah, so help me out. I'll put charity out. <laughs> Buy some product. <laughs> when and where is your next? Oh, Pat's making a huge announcement. Thank you, Pat. That's so wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry, my dear. Um, uh, so healingandcancer.org, you, um, you can go to the website and you'll see it otherwise. But I really would love to come back to Gilda's Club. This is actually a perfect room. It's the right size for a weekend retreat. So, yeah. yeah. But we have friends from London who came, we went to a 2015 retreat. And I, I want to see Andre. Come on, come on, to Peltu. Eve, Eve was at uh, Brain Tumor. And on our, our website is actually um, a documentary of the Brain Tumor Retreat, which really goes to the, the spirituality of our, our talk. So go to the website under videos and documentaries, and you'll see Eve on camera. So, yeah. We want to thank Dr. Rob Rutledge and say thank you to the people out there who have been watching. Um, and we hope that you really enjoyed our conversation at Gilda's Club. We hope that you go on our YouTube and press subscribe and check out so you'll be able to hear all of our live streams that are coming up. Um, so you'll be able to hear wonderful speakers like Dr. Rob, 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 Rob Rutledge. Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, Hi, Rob. And, uh, and this will be on YouTube, so you can share it. So if you found it really inspiring and you want to share with people who might not be living here, we really ask you to share so that everyone can kind of get these wonderful education sessions. So thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Wonderful audience. You guys are great. Come chat with me if you want to. Yeah. <laughs>